Good morning. Uh, today, I welcome Dr. Will Morris of Cleveland Clinic Innovation. Uh, he is a prolific inventor and innovator, and will have a chance today to dig into uh, everything that is related to next generation of uh, clinical healthcare tools, but also healthcare and innovation uh, in general. Uh, Dr. Morris, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Great. So. Straight away, I, 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 I wanted to know what is the technologies that you are most uh, excited or happy about uh, that would bring innovation in uh, clinical care, but also healthcare in, in general? Yeah. So, you know, the clinic is, uh, Cleveland Clinic is celebrating our 100th year. Um, and one of our cornerstone is, is innovation. We believe that part of our special sauce is not just clinical mastery, uh, research education, but the fourth aspect is innovation. From the first coronary angiography um, to the first coronary artery bypass, technical, clinical, device, life science, and health information technology innovation has been our core. Um, every year we celebrate the top 10 uh, innovations that we canvass uh, nearly all of our physicians to say, what are those things that are going to impact patient care in a positive way? And the way to kind of think about that, there's three big, large domains. There's devices, right? Things like a total knee, a valve. Um, there are life sciences, and certainly with COVID, um, the pandemic, vaccine generation is one example of, of, of life science. So these are drug discoveries, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Um, and the last is health information technology. How can technology, such as even you know, telecommunication, impact patient care? Um, and so our top 10 innovations celebrates all aspects of those. Um, and so you know, for you to ask you know, which are the ones that excite me, all of them. Um, you know, there's uh, many opportunities for us to impact patient care in a positive way, better health, better outcomes, better quality, and lower cost. Um, but I'm happy to dive into any specific domain that you wish. So if we take these, these three uh, verticals that you, that you just uh, mentioned, let, let's start with the medical side of, uh, of things, not the life side, but the medical side of, of which, which where, where do you see innovation uh, within your, your ranking uh, for this year? What would be the two or, or three main uh, key innovations that you would mention? Yeah, so, so I think we're seeing some unbelievable uh, breakthroughs in, in medical uh, personalized medicine. So um, advances like gene therapy in one of the areas where it's the treatment for sickle cell and thalassemia using genetic splicing, CRISPR um, is the technical name, um, and an ability to go in there and insert, edit, erroneous DNA, the code of life, and insert the proper genetic code, absolutely game-changing because it doesn't just treat a symptom, it actually cures the disease. And this is unprecedented when we think about modern medicine. And, and so these, this CRISPR, is it more coming from large institutions that are doing the research or is it uh, new startups that are uh, disrupting yep. the way things work? Or is it a collaboration? I mean, COVID-19, we've seen like this collaboration happen that was unexpected, let, let's say the least. How, how, is, how is it uh, going through this uh, innovation? Where is it coming from mainly? Yeah, I, I, I think you, you nailed it. It's collaboration. And I think COVID has highlighted the collaboration that perhaps had been invisible to you know, the public and the press. Um, but these are the sites of, of, of collaborations. You know, academic and researchers often take that bench top research, you know, very painstaking, arduous work to get there. If we think about the vaccine for a second to put things in perspective, it's unprecedented in the past six months that we might actually have a, a novel candidate to, to, to get actually vaccines for patients across the world. But behind the scenes, Behind that announcement, years of RNA platform work and research led up to that. So I want to make sure that while we talk about you know, these novel discoveries, there is painstaking work, 
years of laborious uh, work and, and, and um, you know, publishing and uh, continuous pursuit of, of these novel targets. So it is a journey. It is a long journey. Um, but yes, uh, to, to your question, where is it occurring? It's, it's, it's happening all over. It's happening at the bedside. It's happening at the bench. It's happening in academics. It's happening in startups. Um, the best course of action is, luckily, we all have a singular North Star, which is how do we benefit the population? How do we benefit a patient? Um, and we need all, all of the team members to be rowing in that direction. And so do you, do you see these efforts being more at, on a prevention level? Uh, so I give you an example. In the Middle East and in the Gulf region, you, you, you mentioned some of them, but let's say diabetes and uh, oncology and cancer are, are, are big, big issues. Uh, how does this innovation play in on these particular uh, illnesses? Yeah, I mean, so so if we look at the spectrum of disease, certainly um, there's the maintenance and the treatment of a disease like diabetes, insulin being being one. Um, but how do we actually move upstream? How do we actually diagnose things earlier, like cancer, or even before they have cancer, prevent it, right? So prevention and intervention, you know, these are the types of interve inter interventions that we would want. As clinicians, oftentimes the hit through the history of medicine, we've only been uh, focused on the, the manifestation of disease, the manifestation of diabetes, the impact of kidneys and the eyes and the, and, the, and the nerves and trying to manage blood sugars. Well, how do we actually prevent it? How do we actually cure it? You know, these are the, the core efforts to kind of shift to the left. Because ultimately what we want to be driving towards is not the maintenance of, of, of health, but the true, you know, uh, preserving of health and driving towards wellness. Uh, to, to continue on your, on your thought, and if you look at uh, what COVID-19 has also shown is uh, a problem with this entire supply chain of, of, of healthcare and interconnections. And so as a result, in the GCC region, uh, let's say Abu Dhabi, the UAE, but also Saudi Arabia, they are trying to anchor research. They are trying to anchor uh, some uh, innovation within the, the, the healthcare. Uh, what would you see as a uh, potential formula uh, to be successful in this uh, endeavor? Well, I think that's exactly right. I, I, I think these ideas of hubs and spokes, and you want a critical mass of resources that are locally reflecting the needs and wants and desires of your, of your citizens in the city. Um, and so we're beginning to see, you know, obviously Cleveland Clinic has the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi um, Hospital, um, you know, unbelievable multinational uh, system. And how do we actually then drive towards uh, research, collaboration, innovation with such a rich um, you know, vast talent in, in such a um, diverse population. How do we tap into that? I think it's a unrealized asset that um, you know the Gulf region certainly has, and, and we see that on the states, right? So you mentioned supply chain. What do we need to do to ensure the integrity of supply chain and innovate locally, but also kind of recognize that we can't do everything, and so it, it requires these hubs and spokes, right? We need our partnerships. We need our conduits. But when the system fails, right, when, when COVID hit and stressed it, we can't have a complete uh, collapsing of it. We need some redundancies and safety. And so we do believe like the hub and spoke, but you need to have multiple spokes in case one of them goes away. You don't want that, you know, the wheel to collapse. And so uh, if you look at the process of innovation, the process of, of disruption, there's a big need for investment. And so... Uh, how does that play, do you think, will, how did COVID-19 might change uh, the, the access to investment? Is, will it make it uh, easier for large pharmaceutical and large healthcare group? Or will it also pour into also the, the different startups that are trying to innovate? Yeah, I think there's a positive consequence of both, right? Uh, attention and, and focus that healthcare impacts all. It also uh, discriminates all, right? When we don't have access, it hurts all of us. And so 
um, there's a real call to action. And again, back to your comment of, you know, where is it happening? It's happening everywhere. And you need a healthy ecosystem. And in order to have a healthy ecosystem, yes, you need the anchor tenants. You need the large pharmaceutical companies that have massive capital that can de-risk stuff. But you also need entrepreneurs. You need the capital to support those entrepreneurs. These are high risk, high reward potential opportunities. And so you need to have that kind of healthy ecosystem, which is diversity at the end of the day. And so you, you, you mentioned that you, you have the, the I want to go back to, to this the ranking that you that you do of uh, around innovation. And so you just met, you mentioned one. Could you mention uh, like in, in other verticals? Uh, sure. innovation that that you are and make it simple for for us uh, common people sure well i mean one of them is actually so one of the the top 10 innovation was telehealth right so the ability to do distance health now you might say your audience might say well we we've, we've seen telehealth we we're doing zoom right now i've zoomed with my primary care physician uh, or my general practitioner um, what's what's game changing around that well while we have the technology, what was actually a friction point was a lot of the policy and regulations that have layered on over the years. Now, these policies and regulations, you know, bore out of when we had physical interactions, right? As a physician, I li live in the United States, but I only can practice where my license can say. So I'm geographically constrained. And that makes sense because it's not like I would drive 100 or, you know, 300 miles elsewhere to treat a patient. Um, and so that model of local policy and local state licensure made sense. But now COVID, now telehealth, where that patient might be in a rural area, might be out in the Gulf Coast, might be out in a uh, you know, carrier somewhere, might be out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, how do I actually you know, remove time and space? And, and at the end of the day, what that patient needs and what that provider needs is they need to connect and they need to focus on the outcome of that patient. Um, and so what we've seen with COVID, at least in the United States, is a lot of flexibility and removal of the old barriers, these old outdated political models that prevented us from having a therapeutic uh, session and me prescribing something or managing something or evaluating it. And that is a game changer. That is something that, you know, wasn't innovative. It was removing barriers. And that's really important, I think, for the public and the world to kind of see is sometimes we are our own worst enemies. We create these policies and they, they, they block information sharing. Um, and so on the global ever, uh, you know, why that's globally important is the idea of data sharing and driving insights. You know, while we want to have privacy, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing for data privacy and, and, and um, uh, in, ensuring the integrity of the data, um, we also recognize that it is a collaborative sport. Um, and so we need to have policies and procedures that kind of reflect that ecosystem. So I'd say that's around HI, you know, health information technology on the policy side. That's it. It's highly innovative because it's changed the game. It's disrupted the way we thought about telemedicine. Um, shifting gears into something like a device or physical, um, you know, we, we were really, really passionate about um, uh, postpartum or after delivery hemorrhage um, for, for, for mothers is devastating. Um, a, you know, it can be life-threatening, but B, um, it also can result in the loss of the uterus, which would make the, the woman sterile. Um, traditionally, we, we had a, a, a means which was called a balloon tamponade that would expand. Um, this innovation is, is to me the perfect example of something that's elegant, simple, and affordable. Um, this is actually causes a, a vacuum and it actually collapses the uterus, which mimics physiology. I'll spare you the details, but if you go online, we'll include the hyperlink, um, you'll see the video. And it, it intuitively makes sense. But the great thing is it works. It's highly effective in protecting the mom. And it's dirt cheap and available in all developing countries, a vacuum. It's, it, and so what we love about it is it's not 
you know, uh, you know, unbelievably unprecedented in terms of its novel aspects. It is very simple, and what it's done is is allowed an important therapeutic to be offered to all women across the world. Another point, I mean, every business is has been transformed. You mentioned it around data and machine learning and AI. Uh, we're seeing, I think, in the diagnostic part of, of uh, your, your uh, industry, a lot of uh, play around this, this, this thing. Uh, will basically AI replace uh, human and robotics uh, in the medical field as well? Yeah. Uh, how, how, will it, how, how, how does it enhance uh, the offering? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a common misnomer. It'll never replace. Um, AI is really good at computation and math things on the, um, but, but it's not good at the creativity of the human brain. And that's where we want. And, and um, you know, we want physicians and nurses and all caregivers to be focused on that. Um, but repetitive tasks and things that humans aren't necessarily good at, the robot's perfect for it or AI machine learning. So we look at it as a means to enhance, to give you, quote, superhuman powers, right? To make you better um, at doing a task, a procedure, or doing device. So, um, you know, it's a common misnomer. Will Dr. Google, you know, take over a radiologist job and read the, read the images? No, um, that is far off. No different than, you know, will Tesla replace all the need for drivers? We'll, we'll know. Um, but it makes you a better driver, right? It, you know, now common in many cars is the, the video camera on the back that alerts if you're hitting something. That's not replacing the driver, that's enhancing your experience, enhancing your safety and improving outcome. Um, and, and that is, I think, the, the very pragmatic application of AI ML. It's not some fantasy world that it's gonna, you know, HAL is gonna replace us all but it really is critical. So you have to be uh, a healthy skeptic and be aware of, of, of big titles and, and, and stuff like that, but you also have to embrace it, that this is, as you mentioned, data is power, is insight. And shame on us if we don't actually continuously learn on how we do things and how we make it better. I have a, a, a final question and it's, Prior to COVID-19, uh, all we would read about is that we can re we're going to be able to replace all your uh, failed organs and you will be able to live until 120 and, and 130 year old. And suddenly we're, we're seeing uh, the high risk. So are we going back to this type of a vision pushed by tech companies or was it always just uh, headlines for, 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 for media? Yeah, uh, you know, human longevity and, 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 and is, is always uh, it's, it's an attention grabber. Um, but, you know, there is some important science. Um, so to me, the question is not, hey, I'm trying to create something that will allow us to live long. You know, to me, it's really understanding the foundations of, of life and why we get disease, why we have these uh, failures. And if we understand the why, then we can then theoretically understand how we prevent. Um, how do we prevent heart disease? How do we prevent liver failure and kidney failure? Um, so I think, you know, when I see company, you know, wants to create the, um, the holy grail, so to speak, and an eternal life, um, you know, that is, that is fantasyful. Um, but what is not is the hard evidence science that every day occurs across the world in quiet research facilities, hospital systems, pharmaceutical companies that are relentlessly trying to uncover and unravel the mysteries of life of the why, and then how do we alleviate pain and suffering? Um, so I take those quick, you know, those, those headlines with a grain of salt, um, but what I do hold is true is the unbelievable hard science and hard evidence. And at the end of the day, the data is the most important thing and, and the trust of the public that, you know, that we hold, hold dear. Just one last point, because around data, I believe that we've seen that thanks to data, we've realized that your address or your PO box or, or where you live really 
it defines your level of healthcare and also your uh, life uh, longevity. So, and we're seeing it today when we talk about uh, COVID-19, the vaccine, uh, by the time it gets to some areas or some region, it, it, it's, it might take a lot, a lot of time. Do you think that there needs to be a reevaluation of how uh, we deal with healthcare and, and medicine uh, and it should be a global dialogue around it and have a, as we, we everybody's talking today, a great reset for this sector as well? Yeah, I think you're, you're addressing what is the, you know, the elephant, the other pandemic, which is health disparities. Um, where you are born or where you live almost establishes, you know, what access you have. If you are born next to the Cleveland Clinic, or Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, you have access to world-class clinicians and nurses and researchers. But if you're in rural, uh, a rural area, what about that human and, and, and what is it about? Do we tolerate that degree of, of, of disparity? And I think that's, that is, um, you know, through COVID, through that lens, it's, it's cast a light and we can't turn it off. We should, we should embrace it to, so to your point, um, I don't think a, a recess is necessarily the word. I, I would say it is a call to action. It's a clarion call to really address this. We know it's true. Uh, we've known it to be true. Um, and we need to be thinking about <clears throat> the global good and how do we actually impact not individual pockets of patients, but all patients anywhere all the time. Dr. Morris, thank you so much uh, for your time. And I think that through innovation and technology, there might be the beginning of an answer to uh, having a global and broader approach to, to healthcare. Absolutely. And uh, through these dialogues and sharing information, I think this is just the beginning of the journey. So I appreciate your time and thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.